what does this mystery have to do with Donald Trump and the events that took place on January 6th on Capitol Hill? Behind the leaders of our time and events of our time, there are actually prototypes in the Bible that they're following without knowing it. To set the stage, Donald Trump, the prototype he's following is that of a man called Jehu. Jehu was a man in the Bible who was wild, he was unpredictable, you never knew what he was going to say or do next. We don't know where he was with God, but God used him. Jehu begins a race to the throne, and as he goes to the throne, Jehu makes an alliance with the religious conservatives of his land. At one point, Jehu calls for people to come to an assembly in the capital city. And then the people of Jehu storm the Capitol building. Hey y'all, this is Troy Black. So I have Jonathan Kahn with me today, and he is going to be talking about an ancient mystery that he has just described in detail in his new book, The Josiah Manifesto. So Jonathan, could you just start us out and maybe reveal a little bit about what this mystery is? Yeah, it, it's in one hand, the Josiah Manifesto opens up many mysteries, and yet they all converge to then open up an answer. And that is, I would say, what if the Lord was showing us where we are prophetically and where we're heading and what we need to know for what is coming in the days ahead? What if he was giving a blueprint from his word, but that's a point for now about how to stand, how to survive, how to thrive in what is coming in the days ahead, in the end times? That is what the Josiah Manifesto is going to open up. The subtitle is The Ancient Mystery and Guide for the End Times. And I've, I've never written a book that has so much dealing with the answer or, or what to do specifically. Troy, many of the books that I've written or the mysteries I've dealt with are coming home and coming together in the Josiah Manifesto. And when they come together, they open up a key, which is the last part of it. The last third is, in a sense, the manifesto or the guide or the blueprint about what to do, about how to live, how to overcome, what we need to know for the end time. So I think it's one of the most important books I could have written. Yeah, I agree. And you know, you talk about what happened with the plague in America in 2020, but you also addressed a lot of other issues that were huge in the news in that year, you know, that many people will remember immediately when you say them. But one of those is what happened on January 6th on Capitol Hill. What does this mystery have to do with Donald Trump and the events that took place there? Yeah, this is, you know, and and, and you know it, Troy, because you read it, but it, this is, you see all these mysteries, but then they're all connected. They all come together. And um, right. one of the books I'd written a few years ago was called The Paradigm. And things that from The Paradigm, after I wrote it, have been coming true. And it was spoken of in The Paradigm, but it came true after, so it's in the manifesto. And that is that behind the leaders of our time and events of our time, there are actually prototypes in the Bible that they're following without knowing it. And it's a prototype that has to do with when Israel was falling away from God, which you can link to America. And I'll, I will say just a few things to set the stage. Donald Trump, the prototype he's following without knowing it is that of a man called Jehu. Jehu was a man in the Bible who was wild. He was unpredictable. You never knew what he was going to say or do next. We don't know where he was with God, but God used him. And so, you know, mm -hmm. look at Trump, unpredictable, wild, all that. But the Jehu then begins a race to the throne, and so does Donald Trump. And as he goes to the throne, Jehu makes an alliance with the religious conservatives of his land. So did Donald Trump. Now, this goes, if you go forward, there's so much to this. But when on January 6th, well, th there is a prototype in the Bible. At one point, Jehu calls for people to come to an assembly in the capital city. So did Trump on January 6th. The people of Jehu end up surrounding a great capital building, a great capital temple building in the capital. They surround it. So on that day, and listen, we're not, I'm not condoning it, nothing. We're just giving revelation. Uh, right. The people of Trump surround our capital building. Then at one point, there are proceedings going on in that temple or that capital building of Jehu. And so with the capital building, proceedings going on. And then the people of Jehu storm the Capitol building. And so wow. this is all linked to something. See, Jehu was the one who ends up pulling down the Temple of Baal. And, you know, mm -hmm. the Temple of Baal is where they're offering up children, you know, as we're right. talking about this. Well, the modern day Temple of Baal for America, through which we killed children, was Roe versus Wade. We killed 60 million children. And right. so just by the paradigm, and this came, again, true after the book, years after the book, even after Trump's presidency, is that Trump, he walked in the footsteps of Jehu, was used 
to pull down Roe versus Wade, that was not an accident. And he did it yeah. by appointing three people. And one of those people, if you remember, that was Kavanaugh. And all hell broke loose on Capitol Hill when they were having the hearings because of the issue of abortion. And while that happened, a strange object appeared in Washington. And it appeared right in front of the Capitol building while the, the hearings are going on. And it was the Arch of Baal, the Arch wow. of the Temple of Baal, which Jehu pulled down. It's now the battle. There's a spiritual battle going on regarding yeah. life in America. And this was linked to all these things. So even you have, you know, we talked about the plague and, and the sin of abortion. And now we have a, a mystery leading to the overturning of the temple of abortion. So while these events were happening in 2020, those who you know know Jesus for themselves, they have been covered by the blood of the Lamb. Things are passing by, you know, in a sense, especially spiritually speaking. And even today, with the events that are happening in the world today, there, I think there's a lot of fear that can be raised. You know, and another thing that you mentioned in the book specifically, you said the answer to fear is not the absence of evil, but the presence of God. Yeah. See, just because the people were told to go into their homes, it doesn't mean the plague wasn't passing by. It was still there. Yes. But they, yes. they were where God had them, you know, and I believe that yes. is what this manifesto is focused on is yes. where do we need to be as Christians yeah. in this yeah. day and age? So could you just share a little yes. bit about that? Yeah, there's so many mysteries and we touch on some, but there's more. But the thing is that they all converge as we're talking about, and they converge to point to one single thing. And you won't forget it. If you, if you look at the cover, this is the sign right here. This is an altar. The greatest, the most brazen altar we have in America has been that of Roe versus Wade, where we offer it up. We literally sacrificed 60 million children. Yet, yet God moved all these things and God literally broke that altar of Roe versus Wade. It was the hand of God. I mean, you could see it. Yeah. It was the hand of God. And it happened, by the way, you know, again, you had the three years of abortion at the beginning. You have a, the jubilee of that three years. And at the end, the last part, the altar is broken. Well, the broken altar is a biblical sign. It's a sign in the Bible again and again. It's one of the most powerful signs because it's a sign of change. It's a sign of actually revival. They didn't, you know, when there was revival back then, the sign wasn't a, a tent meeting. It was the breaking of the altars of the gods. And by the way, yeah. Troy, a little kind of secret behind it is the last time I was on with you, we, we talked about the return of the gods. And the return of the gods speaks about the spirits and the gods and the altars. The day I finished the return of the gods, the day I finished it was June 24th. It was the day that God broke the altar of Roe versus Wade. Of the, wow. of the gods, of all, and that's when he gave me, okay, now you're going to give my people an answer. You know, now yeah. I'm doing this. So the thing is that the sign of the broken altar points to one person in the Bible more than any other, and that's Josiah, because his birth was actually prophesied over a broken altar, when God actually broke an altar. And then wow. his life was breaking the altars of the gods. You know, in his time, you know, he had, there was evil, you know, there was sexual immorality, there was abortion, there was gender confusion, and he, and there were altars for all of them. They were linked to the gods, and he broke them down and led to revival. In the midst of all this evil, he brought revival. One man was used by God. And so that's where I said, oh God, you are pointing us to something here, because it all points to the broken altar, that's the sign, and that points mm. to Josiah. We are at the Josiah moment, and the Josiah moment, it was late when Josiah came into it. And the thing is that we are at a similar time where on one hand, we have a nation that is at war with God, you know, in so many ways, and there's judgment on that one side of that. We're mm -hmm. heading to judgment. On the other hand, there's the chance for revival. So it's either judgment, revival or judgment. Without revival, America is lost, you know? And so that's the Josiah moment. And so what's going to happen? And what do we need to do? Because this is about the end times. You have all these things going on, as you said, but what do we do? And so I said, mm -hmm. that's where Josiah comes in because I said, Lord, I said, you you had this Josiah as a sign to us because Josiah prospered. You know, Josiah was in the midst of all this evil, and yet he resisted it. He didn't just resist it. He actually overcame it. He actually mm. affected it. He actually, trans he actually, one person changed the course of his nation. So the thing is that wow. this is a, a real picture for now and a picture for the end times. Because the, the point is, uh, there's so many things here. One is God is never finished. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter if you live under persecution or you live in a, a, a place of apostasy. You've got a calling. Josiah didn't matter. He didn't say, okay, it's so bad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. No, he, he said, I have a job. God called me. He put mm -hmm. me on earth for this hour. And we are put on this earth for this hour. You know, we, we are not to be afraid of the end times. God put us here. So we have a job to do. 
And we can't be as, you know, if we're the light of the world, we can't be saying, oh, it's so dark, we better hide our light because they'll cancel us. No, that's the time when you have to shine more. <laughs> that's when you're, you've got your job. Yeah. That's why you're on earth, you know? So the thing is that there's so many secrets or what's the strategy of Josiah? What are the powers he had in God? What did he do? What were his practices? And because in that are how to overcome and to do what God called us to do. Not in fear, as you said, you know, we are here for a purpose, but there's so many things in this about how to separate from the darkness, but also how to transform the darkness. What do you do if the government tells you you're going to have to bow down in some way, you're going to have to go against God? What do you do? You know, what, what do you do in the end times? Because the thing is, it, God is never finished. We're on earth. We could have been in heaven right now. We're on earth right. because God has a purpose for us. We are to be part of the answer, no matter what age we live in. And so that's what I believe. So the, the last third of the book, as you said, and you know it, because the last third is the manifesto or the blueprint mm. or the guide about what do we do? How do we handle this? What do we deal with all these things that we are dealing with, that we're going to deal with? How do we do it and still overcome and be victorious as God has called it? Well, Josiah was, and we have to be for such a time as this. Amen. Yeah, one of the things, I just want to read a quote from the book real fast, and I'm going to have you pray, and we're going to finish. But this is what you said on page 240. You said, if the righteous seek only to change the outward structures of culture, laws, institutions, and systems, their efforts will be undone. If one changes laws without changing hearts, the changed laws will be changed back by the unchanged hearts. Yeah. And I believe you could be talking both about unbelievers, you know, who need to meet the Lord, but also about believers' hearts. And I believe it starts with our hearts, you know, right here right now making that decision in our hearts it's just like the kids song i sung to my young kids last night as they were going to bed i'm gonna let my little light shine like i'm not gonna hide it under a bushel i'm gonna be a city set on a hill and i'm gonna be shining the light of jesus christ to the world that's a decision we have to make in our hearts so could you pray for those who are believers to make that decision today and to not be afraid and for those who are afraid to take that fear back to the lord and let his presence deal with that so that we can move forward in faith but also for those, if there's anyone listening who doesn't know the Lord, could you just pray for them to have a revelation of Jesus Christ for themselves yes. as well? Yes. Yeah, let's all come together right now. This is this is the hour. God has called all, all of us. The one thing everybody has in common is we were called for this hour. We were called to be born and to do it. So there's a purpose, whether you know God, and if you don't know God, to come to know Him. Lord, we just praise you, and we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for everyone who's listening, watching, who's going to yes, do that Lord. in the future. Lord, we ask you touch every life right now, no matter where yes. they're at. You're with them right now. Lord, we ask your hand upon them. First of all, Lord, we ask you give power and, and strength and courage to your people. Lord, we ask you take away a spirit of fear and replace it with a spirit of joy and courage and confidence mm -hmm. uh, with you. Lord, yeah. we, we commit together, Lord, that we're not going to hide your life. Lord, that you have put us on earth not to hide. And you put us on earth not to run from and not to, Lord, be just reacting to this world, but to actually mm -hmm. be an answer, lights to it. So, Father, we, we commit to you, Lord, regardless. We're not going to look at the cost for each of us. We're not going to look at what does it do for us. We're going to live for your glory. And so, Lord, we're going to yes, stand yeah. for truth because only that way can, Lord, others come to know you. So, Father... Help us to shine our light. Lord, we will not hide it anymore. We will not lessen it. We will not soften it. We will, Lord, manifest the truth and manifest your power, Lord. Let our life be lights, Lord, witnesses to this generation, Father, for our age, for the time in which you placed us in our mother's womb. And Father, Amen. Lord, we want to go all out for you, Lord. And we pray for revival. And we pray for, Lord, a great revival to happen in our day, Lord. In America, in the world, Lord, your end time harvest. You promised to pour out your spirit. Lord, help us to live in that, in the power of your spirit. And Lord, let it flow, yes, Father, Lord. we ask, upon this earth. And Lord, we ask for all those right now who may not know you or, or may not be sure they're right with you or they don't know if they're born again or they have salvation. Lord, show them now, Lord, how to come and how to get right with you and how to simply receive you into their hearts and begin living for you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I ask you touch each of them right now and let them come fully to what you have called them to be for such a time as this. In the name above every name, the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our great King, our Savior, our Shepherd, and our friend. In his holy name, amen. Amen. Let's overcome hatred with love. Try it. You know, because God, God gives you the power to confound the system. When you hate your enemy, that's nothing new.
Let me give you an example. Somebody hates you. They do things against you. What's your natural reaction? You hate them back. You hate them back. So look, we hate them. Why? Because they hate us. They, they're hateful people. So how am I going to respond? I hate them back. Well, that's natural. And that happens all the time. But wait a minute. You're, try, you're coming against hate with hate. You're trying to cast out Satan with Satan. Or somebody speaking against you, you find out. How you're, they're speaking against you. That's terrible. They're gossiping. Why? Well, what do you do? You speak against them. Wait a minute. <laughs> you're doing the same thing. That's casting out Satan by Satan. Or somebody's not loving you. You know, there's not enough love here. You know, oh, you have people in the Lord. It doesn't matter who. You know, there's not enough love. I, people don't love me. Well, you, you know, you know, so, so you, when, you, when you're saying that, people should love me, people should... You're not loving anybody. You're angry at people. So you're responding to the lack of love We're, with more lack of love. But the point is, if you react to evil, evil with evil, that's all you're going to be losing. That's it. It's a, you know, like we should know it in our head, but we get fooled by this because Satan loves this. You cannot fight darkness with darkness. You can't fight hatred with hatred. You can't fight sin with sin. You can't fight condemnation by condemning them. You can't overcome the self, yourself, by yourself, with yourself. You can't cast out Satan with Satan. And yet the answer is in his reply. When it's real, it's, it's, it seems so simple. It's, it's so revolutionary. It seems it's the opposite of the way we think because we answer in kind. We tend to. But Messiah says, no, no, I cast out the spirit of darkness by the spirit of light, by the spirit of God. So here's the principle. How do you overcome anything? Anything that's dark, you do it not in kind, you do it by its opposite. What's the opposite of Satan? God. In a sense. What's this, what do you cast an evil spirit out? By the Spirit of God. You cast out evil, no matter where it is in your life, or darkness, by its opposite. Let's look at it now. Let's see how it goes. You're dealing with hate. Somebody hates you. Natural response, I hate them back. But how do you cast out Satan that way you don't? How do you cast it out? What's the opposite of hate? Love. What does Jesus say? What is, he said, love your enemy. That is not natural. Because we hate our enemy. That's why they're our enemy and we're the enemy. But when you do that, you're actually joining. You're becoming like your enemy. It makes no sense. But he says, the way you break it, Love your enemy. Somebody takes your coat, give them another one. That person hates you, give them a gift. Love your enemy, not because you're weak, because you're strong. Love them because you have something better than they have. Put yourself in their place. You know what happens when you, you, know what happens when you love your enemy? First thing is to you. All of a sudden, you don't fear them. You don't have anxiety anymore. You're actually loving them. It just casts it out. You're dealing with hurt. People hurt you. Okay, everybody gets hurt. What's the opposite of hurt? Healing. You've been hurt? Hurt people, hurt people. Healed people, heal people. Focus on healing. Focus on other people. Focus on blessing other people. God will bring healing to your own wounds. That's what He does. You're dealing with the flesh. You're trying to overcome your flesh. It's tough to overcome your flesh. You know, I, don't, I want to stop sitting. I want to stop doing this. All right, we all know it. We, everybody deals with it. You know, you try to do it. I'm going to willpower. I'm going to do that. But the flesh is flesh. Why is that hard? Because you can't overcome the flesh with flesh. If it's coming from you, from your strength, that's the flesh. So what's the opposite of flesh? The flesh? The spirit. How do you overcome the flesh? By really, by getting totally into the spirit of God. What does it say? The Bible says, Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It doesn't say try to fight the lusts of the flesh by yourself. It says get into the opposite of it, and you will overcome it. Because the Spirit will overcome that. You're dealing with a lot of bad news. Well, how do you, what's your answer? You're going to respond to the bad news. You're going to get angry, get, get, get cynical, get fearful, get anxious about it. What's the opposite of bad news? The answer is good news. How do you overcome the world, the, the, the bad news in the world, the bad news in your life, or whatever's coming around you? By the good news of God. 
So get into the good news. Get into the gospel. Stop dwelling on the problem. Start dwelling on the answer. You know, and that's the opposite because when we, that when we had a problem, we tend to dwell more on the problem. The problem keeps us dwelling on the problem. And that's the natural way, but it's the revolutionary way to say, forget the problem. I'm going to dwell on the answer now. And then by that power. You know, we were on one tour in the early days in Jerusalem. We were in the house of Caiaphas where they kept Jesus. They kept Yeshua. And we do know, we have the evidence there that this was the house of the high priest. So he would have been there. And there's a courtyard out there where, where Peter would have denied the Lord. And I'm not going to go into it, but it's amazing. I always say, they have a whole statue of him messing up. You know, we won't go into that. So there's a dungeon and people go, we go down to the dungeon where people then remember what the Lord did for them. You know, and they're in the dungeon and we're having a great time. But then there's a, they, you know, there's only one stair, it's like a stone staircase that comes down into the dungeon and we're all down. We're having, but there's this group up there and they're getting really angry that we're taking time. They're getting angry. I don't think they were believers, but I mean nominal Christian probably, but they're angry. We're hearing, we're hearing like noises, you know. And, and, we, you know, and we're about, about 50 angry people on that staircase. And, and, and we have to get, go up that staircase. And so, you know, we got to go up. And I said to them, I said to the people, so I said without them, I said, when you go up, thank each of them for being so patient, for waiting for us. So they go up and, the, and our people, oh, thank you, thank you, sorry, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm the last person. By the time I go up, all these people are smiling and loving and beautiful. <laughs> They're practically thanking me for taking too much time. I mean, if there were two more people, they would have given me an award at the end, you know. <laughs> you know, but, the thing, but instead of being, reacting to that, which is the natural thing, we said, let's not react to it. Let's act upon it. Let's, act, let's overcome hatred with love. Try it. You know, because God, God gives you the power to confound the system. When you hate your enemy, that's nothing new. That's the system. When you love your enemy, you're confounding them. When you bless someone, curses you, curse them back, okay, makes sense. Bless them, it doesn't make sense, confounds the whole system. You can transform them. But then you see you're not a mirror in the world, you're a light in the world. You overcome by the opposite. You're dealing with sin and maybe you're focusing on your sin. Well, listen, that's, that's part of repentance, but it doesn't give you the power. You're not going to overcome your sin or your brother's sin or your sister's sin by focusing on the sin. The more you focus on the sin, the worse you get. How do you overcome sin by focusing on the opposite of sin? God. You fill yourself up with God. You cannot overcome by yourself. You've got to fill yourself with God and that will overcome the sin. Focus on that. You're dealing with selfishness. It's hard to overcome selfishness with yourself. But with God you can because you, and you move from a, from a self-centered life to a you-centered life, God. When you focus on God you can overcome anything. There was a man in a communist prison who used to they had them terrorize the, the women prisoners. You know, there were Christians there and for their faith. And, and this man had been, this man was abused from childhood, this monster of a man. And he would rape them, terrorize them. I mean, one day he approached this Christian woman to do that, to terrorize her. But instead of cowering from her, she approached him. And he said, aren't you afraid? He said, I'm not afraid. They said, well, how can you not be afraid? What about to? He said, I, I, I see you as a child. I see you've been mistreated. To become as you are now, that's not who God made you to be. You were never meant to be this person. You weren't meant to terrorize women. You were meant to, to, to love. And he goes, she's going on and on, and it starts breaking. He starts cracking. His defenses crack. He didn't overcome her. She overcame him. And he ended up, she ended up leading him in a prayer to receive the Lord. She ended up discipling him. She was not overcome by evil. Be not overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. You, be not be overcome with evil. You fight back evil. But you're overcoming it with the opposite. You're dealing with rejection. How about forgetting about that? Because you know what? It doesn't matter wh how much you were rejected. Everybody's been rejected. It doesn't matter because now God has accepted you. God accepting you is so much more important than anybody who had issues and rejected you. 
People are people. They got their own issues. They were rejected. What's the, op- wait a minute. What's the opposite of rejection? Acceptance. That I dwell on the acceptance of God. I fill myself up. It says, but now you are beloved children. You are beloved children. You're not here on earth to get people to accept you. You don't need that. You have God who accepted you. You are here not to take, get acceptance. You're here to give acceptance. You're here to give the acceptance of God that people can get saved. You're dealing with the past. Okay, how do we overcome the past? What's the opposite of the past? You could say the future, but really it's the present. How do you overcome the past? Not by dwelling on the past. Dwell on the, be on the present now. You, dwell, you overcome the past, what wasn't there, by what is there now in your life, by all the blessings of God that are now here in the present now. The word presence comes from present. You won't find God's presence by dwelling in the past. You'll find His presence in the present. And that is more powerful than anything. Whatever was done to you, what God did is so much more. Hi, I'm Jonathan Con-